Greetings, folks, and welcome to the live launch party for Musketeers versus Cthulhu in the Court of King Louis from Black Ink Fiction. Uh, it's already out. Uh, as you can see, you can get hold of it in a nice big chunky paperback. Uh, you can also get hold of it in ebook. That's how you get hold of it right there, that little link down the bottom. Uh, the link should be in the comments below. Uh, so just click on that. That's a universal link. It'll take you to Amazon. So, yes, thank you for joining us. Uh, tonight, I have five of my fellow authors from this. Uh, we're going to do a bit of a reading and and then we'll have some banter. And, uh, yeah, if you have any questions for any of us, we'll basically we'll put it around the group. So if you have some questions, get them down in the comments section and we'll go through them at the end. Uh, also, uh, tonight you can win a, uh, a an ebook copy of Musketeers versus Cthulhu. Right. And all you got to do is answer this question. And the first person that in the comments with the correct answer wins an ebook. So here you go. Here's the question. Which Cthulhu mythos entity is also known as the crawling chaos? That's the question. Get that in the comment section and you could win a a win a, a ebook copy. Right. Oh, uh, without further ado, I will bring on my first guest. He is um, one of my co-hosts on the uh, the Innsmouth Book Club podcast. He is my co-host on the um, Dark Sh Strange Shadows, the Clark Ashton Smith podcast. Uh, Mr. Robert Poyton. Hello, sir. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, mon ami. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Bonsoir, indeed. Yes. How, the, how the devil are you? Oh, I'm <laughs> splendid, old chap. <laughs> Lovely in the shirt, mate. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I'd dress the part, but it is quite practical as well, because, uh, you know, it's rather a touch warm today, isn't it? So Yeah, the, the last way, because, I, I mean, I was going to do the same, but all mine are quite heavy. And, yeah, elaborate. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of them are black as well, which doesn't help in this heat. So I've gone for like <laughs> the thinnest T-shirt with the least amount of fabric still attached to it I could possibly find. Maintain some, some degree chested. of modesty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. a little bare chested. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Uh, you are one of the contri contributors to this. Um, would you like to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm uh, Rob Poyton, uh, otherwise known as Innsmouth Gold. Uh, I'm a writer, a uh, musician, though a little bit of a lapsed musician, given the circumstances over the past couple of years. Yeah. And uh, I, I formed Innsmouth Gold, basically I did a, a couple of CDs of Lovecraftian soundscapes and was thinking of, of a way I can get these out. Uh, and nowadays with technology, it's so easy to self-publish and self-promote. So I started with some CDs and then I had to go out writing some stories and put those out and they seem to go down quite well. So from there, I moved on to editing anthologies, which you've been very kind to contribute to the, the last one, Corridors. Yep. And uh, now we've got quite a few titles out, collections of stories, novels across a range of genres, really. And uh, we're planning on getting at least one more anthology out this year. So that's, uh, that's what I spend most of my time doing. Alongside the podcasts, of course. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Which yeah, are great yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, it's really good fun. Uh, yes. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you're one of the contributors. Um, are you going to give us a bit of a reading, sir? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. We'd like to introduce your story and go for it. I will uh, take myself off and uh, uh, I'll come back when you're ready. Okay. So the story is called The Man in the Golden Mask. And it's set a little while after the events in the Three Musketeers. The, uh, the group is split by this time. And D'Artagnan is given a secret solo assignment to rescue a mysterious prisoner from the Fort Royale Fortress in the south of France. So some things happen on the way there. Eventually he gets to the fortress. He sneaks in by crawling through a, a drainage culvert. And his, we, we, sort of join him at this point in the scene where he's got entrance to where the prisoner is being kept. But of course, the room is guarded. The chamber beyond was lit by two standing candelabras. Their ruddy glow showed a table, some chairs, a single door opposite, and three figures now standing in haste at his entrance. Cardinal's guard, the two nearest already moving toward him. And behind them on the other side of the table, D'Artagnan's sworn enemy, Rochefort. 
the musketeer, the musketeer barely had time to throw up his blade to deflect the first attack. He was under no illusions here. Rochefort was deadly, and these would be his best men. Three onto one, grave odds. Again came the twinge of lack of comrades beside him. Still, he had learned much since arriving in Paris. D'Artagnan calmly batted the second thrust aside and countered with the riposte that had his foe springing back. He opened his mouth, dropping the dagger into his left hand, whipping it out immediately into the second attacker's face. That one was prepared, though, his blade already raised to shield. The dagger skittered off into the dark and D'Artagnan was forced to quickly duck as the sword sliced out in reply. He shifted back into the doorway, gaining some protection to his flanks. This was the only exit from the chamber, so, he reasoned, there was a little chance of alarm being raised. Still, he needed to finish this quickly. As a point thrust toward him again, he twisted, feeling it slice the tunic under his arm and immediately struck out. His own point took the attacker in the bicep, stabbing deep into the muscle, then jarring along the bone. The guard yelped and fell back, clutching his arm, dropping the rapier with a clatter. The man's colleague began a furious attack, weaving a web of steel that took all of D'Artagnan's focus and concentration to avoid. Finally, there came an opening. The man was fast and skilled, but he kept to a pattern. D'Artagnan waited, smiled, then took his chance. The guard realized his error, but by then his heart had already been pierced and he fell like a stone, dead before he hit the floor. With a desperate gasp of air, D'Artagnan heaved himself up and back into the room. Rochefort stood still as a statue, eyes glittering cruelly in the moonlight. You smell of shit, he sneered. D'Artagnan gave a mock bow. I apologise if my fragrance offends. I had not the time to change. Still, it is an odour no doubt familiar to you. Then a strange thing happened. Rochefort lowered his sword. You are here for the prisoner, I take it. There seemed little point in denying it. Gascon, I know we have had our differences. I know we serve different masters, but I also know you for a brave and honorable man. I beg of you as one soldier to another, depart this place now, ride away, leave. None will impede your progress. There is no dishonor in this. D'Artagnan raised an eyebrow. Well, that is quite a compliment coming for you, but I have a mission to fulfill one given to me by my captain. You'll understand if I pass on your generous offer. Rochefort scowled. Idiot, you know not who or what you rescue. There are forces at work here beyond your understanding. Forces contained only by the protective methods of our blessed mother church. You play with fire, Gascon, and I would not see you or the rest of us burned. I take my orders from the king, sir, not from that snake, Richelieu. Contempt flashed across the saturnine features. Then you leave me no choice. I shall be forced to kill you. The sword point rose again. On guard. Nice. Nice. Well done, sir. Excellent. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, I, wondered, I wondered if I'd get any iron mask. And uh, I got loads of them <laughs> Did you get loads? i have to yeah. say it was the very first thing that even that the title just came into head man in the golden mask and maybe people will be able to work out what's happening but you know it just seemed a perfect <laughs> fit <laughs> yeah yeah in, in the end I, i've ended up with two in in there two iron mask stories but they're two completely different things so yeah. I, don't, I don't feel like it's any recycling going on and uh, it was uh, John John Houlihan, the other one. Right? Indeed, he, he, indeed he it just was. writes great stuff. I, I love his stories, John. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, it's a really, really good one. Uh, now, this is going to be quite entertaining, but they've got the third member of the Innsmouth Book Club podcast here ah. <laughs> saying, gorgeous shirt, Rob. <laughs> hey, sir. Cheers, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. David Green is here, lurking as usual. Uh, and Beth, <laughs> who was obviously on our Nookie Nomicon. Hey, Beth. Uh, how you doing? The other night. Excellent. Yeah. So like I say, all you guys who are watching, if you've got any comments, any questions, get them in the thing. Also, you can win uh, an ebook just by answering the question that's scrolling at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> right, Rob, I'll take you off and I will uh, bring our next guest on. Righty ho. Our next guest uh, is co-creator of the Stokerverse with Dakar Stoker, uh, Mr. Chris McCauley. Hello. Unmute yourself, mate. 
<laughs> there we go. Hello. There we go. <laughs> How are you doing, man? You're right. I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'm doing all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd had a launch last night, didn't you? Or we had to, yeah, we had the launch of the official Dracula sequel uh, comic book oh. last night. So was it the uh, Dracula and the Cult of the White Worm? So nice. uh, there you go. So we sort of inject a little bit of Lovecraft in with, with Dracula and I, with the cosmic horror stuff of the White Worm. Beautiful. Um, I love, I love, I love White Worm. It's, it's probably my favourite Bram Stoker. Uh, excellent. Yeah. So, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah. So, as stays it, uh, I write um, all sorts of Dracula-related stuff with Decker Stoker. He's the great grand nephew of Bram Stoker. We created a uh, company of business together. We we'll call it Stokerverse, and we've got books, comics, novels, uh, games, video, and tabletop um out at the minute and i also do sci-fi stuff with uh claudia christian um actress in Babylon five uh, amongst many other things and uh yeah we we write together we do sci-fi we do cosmic horror and um yeah uh, we've written a story for for this anthology Indeed, yeah, yeah. I was about to say, yeah, because you co-wrote this story with Claudia Christian. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I liked the fact she did a thing talking about it very briefly on her channel a while ago. and just yeah, mentioned yeah. that when you sent her, sent her a draft over, you were just like, that's really, really bloody and disgusting and disturbing. I did get, I've got that reputation, like, even for the, the work I've done in Doctor Who and Terminator. And right. you know, it's that quite, you know, I'm quite visceral in nature. Yeah. And this... This would have been the first time that I've written anything to do with Lovecraft or, or Cthulhu consciously. Um, yeah. uh, I just stuck to what I know, so it is quite brittle. Excellent. Excellent. Do you want to give us a little bit of a taste then? I will give you a reading, yes. Then. Excellent, sir. Uh, just give me a nod when you're done. Uh, so this particular story is set after uh, The Three Musketeers and uh, everybody's kind of scattered. It focuses primarily on uh, Cardinal Richelieu and Aris. And uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, a taster of this. It was when she removed her eyes that I realized the creature I was looking at wasn't human. She took a pocket knife from the inside of her sleeves of her dress and scooped them out. I watched as she dug deeply. The noises as the blade skewered her optic nerve. That wasn't the worst part, part, however. What chilled me to the core was that while she mutilated herself, she was smiling. Aramis found his mouth suddenly dry as he listened to Richelieu's tale. It was just past the hour of one in the morning. The musketeer broke one of his rules regarding wine and reached towards the jug on the table. As he poured the rich burgundy into the simple wooden cup, he reflected on the night's events. The cardinal had burst into his room. His scarlet robes were torn and his face bloodied and scratched. The statesman looked as if he had been attacked by a wild animal. The normally reserved Richelieu broke into his story as soon as he had gained entry. Offering his guest a cup of the, of the freshly poured wine, Aramis began to ask a myriad of questions. Richelieu shook his head as he drank. Eventually, as he drained the cup, he spoke once again. I will start at the beginning. You have a reputation as a womanizer and a great duelist. However, it is known that you are also a God-fearing man. What I am about to divulge may shock you. Know only that I transgressed divine law for the good of France and her king. A series of stone tablets came into my possession. As a collector of antiquities, I had heard rumours of the existence of a Sumerian text that had been used by cultists. Upon inspection, I found that they contained an incantation to gods far older than our beloved Christ. My understanding was that they would grant great power to the person who wielded them. That power, I assure you, dear Aramis, would have been used to protect our country, her king, and destroy our most hated enemies. In order to commune with these elder beings, I required a conduit, a vessel with which to cross the boundaries of our world and enter another. I used the Lady de Winter. She was summoned, and I had Rochefort bind her to a tall iron chair. I cast off my cross 
and inverted the sacred images of our true Lord. I chanted the text at first. I chanted the text. At first, I could not grasp the cadence, but over time, the words took on a momentum of their own. An icy chill overtook the air, and a heavy atmosphere descended. Upon the fourth, the fourth attempt reading the inc incantation, Lady de Winter began to make unnatural sounds, gurgling and mewing all at once, as if a great multitude of voices were attempting to manifest through her throat and mouth. When her binding snapped and she sprang to her feet, it was then that I realised my great mistake. Aramis, this was no ancient god that I had summoned. Instead, it was a servant of the devil. We may know his name as Lucifer, but as the winter began to speak, I know him by another, Azathoth, a creature who exists at the very centre of the stars. The creature introduced itself as a vassal for this dread lord. Rochford moved forward to protect me. His hand had barely touched the hilt of the sword when the demon spewed a thick green mucus to his face. The stinking fluid clamped to his face, and when he turned to me, his eyes were obsidian. As you can see, I barely made it out alive. There we go, folks. There's a little reading. Nice one, sir. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Now, what we were saying about the, the blood and guts, you start off with eye gouging, and it yeah. only gets worse from there. <laughs> eye gouging. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, every Saturday night out, isn't it? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, oh yeah, uh, John Chadwick asks of you. <laughs> well, as as you saw me sort of stumble over some words, I, I honestly I have slept, but it's been a it's been a very busy week. Yeah, launch of launch of the the Dracula stuff. Uh, world. We've also launched um, the, a demo of a, a video of Dracula video game. Uh, so yeah, bit, bits and pieces like that. But yeah, I've slept. I've slept a little bit, but probably not as much as I should have. <laughs> and uh, Beth comments, that miniature behind you is tripping her out. <laughs> oh, Bram. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there he is. Yep, there's Bram and Old Story. Yep, you can buy one of these at the Bram Stoker Estate Shop. There you are. That's brilliant. <laughs> nice one, matey. Okay, I'll bring you back on in a bit. Right, our next guest is back over here, and he's further up the country, and he says it's still sunny up in Yorkshire, but I don't reckon that's going to last. Yeah. Mr. Mark Rankin. Hello, mate. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good, yeah, thank you, yeah. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, so it's not pissing it down yet. No, it's, it's still just gloomy and threatening and <laughs> North Yorkshire for you, isn't it? No. <laughs> excellent. Right, yeah, so would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm Mark. I'm, as you say, from uh, West Yorkshire. Oh, West. Um, originally from the lovely sound of Leeds. Um, ah. But having moved now further towards Huddersfield. Mm. Um, so that's where my current base is. Um, Writing-wise, I um, haven't got a huge amount of experience, not as much as the other guys, so possibly a bit of a junior member. Um, <laughs> I stumbled on Black Ink um, a while back, um, due to a writing group, I've had a book on my computer for a long time, as I think right. quite a lot of people do. Yes. Um, and have been trying to get somebody to print it for me, to publish it for me even. Um, but a lack of experience is holding me back. Yeah. And it was a fantastic opportunity, I felt, to get some stories down, get some stories out there, yeah. get that experience, have the bio, Look at what I can do. That kind yeah, of thing. exactly, yeah. Um, so I've absolutely made in match made in heaven, and I, I like variety in my writing as well. I like yeah. to think I can turn on pretty much any time you throw at me. So the fact that we've had wolves, we've had witches, we've had Cthulhu. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm in hog's heaven. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, no. I mean, uh, that's pretty much what I did when I started out because I had longer pieces that I did first. Mm -hmm. But obviously nobody's going to touch you without a track record. You, I, I didn't know how to write a cover letter, you know, things like that, that you need these things you need to learn, right? Like yes. formatting and things like that. <laughs> so, yeah, by doing a bunch of short stories and filing them out to people, I basically learned by trial and error how to uh -huh. do all this stuff. So, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, good on you, mate. Excellent. 
So, uh, you want to introduce your story and give us a bit of a reading? Uh, my story is The Mirror of Madame Fortier. Um, right. And it's set, I would say, generally after uh, The Three Musketeers, but not yep. long after The Three Musketeers. So, uh, between, between the two. Has, has gone back to his family for a little bit of a holiday, leaving the three originals there. Um, it centers on Porthos. Excellent. So right has a little bit of an underplayed character. If you watch any of the films, any of the, any of the sort of adaptations that come onto television, he's always treated as a bit of a comedy character. Yeah, he uh, is, isn't that he? Puts him yeah. down a bit. Yeah. Excellent. Right, oh mate, uh, just give me a nod when you're done. Will do. In a scene ripped from the pages of some low fantasy, a woman lay prostrate and naked on the floor's rough boards, her hands reaching forward, grasping at empty air that lay between her and the a linen-clad mirror before her. To her left, several candles of differing heights and thickness flickered and guttered in the face of darkness that had nothing to do with night. And to her right sat a man, clad in robes of yellow, his face lost in the folds of a deep hood. Before him an open book, its pages stained with incalculable age. Lord Haster, god of a thousand unspeakable names, yellow-clad king from beyond, the man intoned, his voice accompanied by the low buzzing which had come to Porthos' ear upon the stair, as if a thousand insects intoned every word with him. We beseech you, come. The way is prepared, the door opened. We invite you, welcome you. Take this poor vessel that you might walk among us toward the completion of your glorious design. For now is a time of madness and revolution, a true fin de cycle. We will tear down the world and build in its place a new Carcosa, wielding sword and pistol and flame in your glorious, unspeakable name. For you we live, for you we kill, for you we will die. No, monsieur, Porthos regained his feet and threw himself towards the hooded form, sending man, book and yellow tallow spilling to the floor. No, I do not think you will. Gaining his knee, uh, his knee, the musketeer yanked the man toward him, grabbing him by the robe and causing the hood to fall from his face to reveal a bed of scar tissue and ugly welts surrounding an over-sensuous mouth and an unclean bandage ripped from some larger piece of cloth and decorated with stains of red and mouldering yellowish brown to mark the sight of long absent eyes. You are too late, musketeer, the zealot hissed. For we have seen the yellow sign. Through these unworthy hands the doorway was crafted, the way prepared, and the vessel readied. Now is the time. He comes. He comes. Yes, the voice of Emily Fortier held a sing-song note such as might befit a child at play. He comes, and gladly I receive him. No, Sophie Delacroix charged forward and grabbed the naked woman by the arm. The helpless stasis of horror dropping from her as she recognised the true peril at hand. No, you do not. You will not belong to this evil, for I am yours as you are mine. And nothing, no man, no devil may ever rend that sunder. She half pulled, half pushed her lover towards the door, ignoring her supplications and desperate attempts to flee from her arms, and kicked it open. The mirror, Porthos, she shouted back. You must destroy the mirror. At her words, Porthos released the robes of the cackling, blinded creature and turned towards the shrouded glass. He stared towards it, a dire hatred burning in his eyes. He was once more blasted by a dark and hopeless horror, surrounded by the cries of the dead and the dying, immersed in the blood of battles distant in both time and place, overcome by the need to surrender, to allow the creeping, horrific magnificence to take his mind and will and escape the freedom of insanity it offered in return. Yes, the prone fanatic lifted his eyeless face towards the musketeer. Yes, give in! Succumb to his eternal unknowable will, become his instrument, take up the yellow banner and wage glorious war upon this world until all is Hasta, and Hasta is all. And that's that.
perfect. <laughs> you know, see, I am a sucker for the king in yellow, so <clears throat> that that was just right on my street. So we got we got a, one thing you you touched on there about about um, focusing on Porthos. Hmm. Uh, it was something I wanted to get. I wanted everybody to get a fair shake. So, like your your story and one of the other ones, Chris Saucy's, I believe, focus on Porthos. There's a couple focuses on focuses on, on Aramis mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. It's like in mine, mine sort of flits between the Musketeer group and uh, Constance. So yeah, so I wanted to get all, a mix of the characters in there because I just didn't want like twelve. D'Artagnan stories, you know, uh, and then, and the same with the mythos aspect as well. I think we've got a really broad spectrum of mythos abominations in there. So yeah, that's, that was something I consciously wanted, which is yeah, so it was perfect. You know, you got the king in yellow, you got Porthos, perfect. Yeah, nice one, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, yeah. Uh, I will uh, bring you back on in a mo. I'll just uh, get the next guest on. Okay, our next guest. I don't know what he's been doing, but I don't think like um, I don't know if you guys know behind the screen there. I can see you all at the bottom, and he's been like the camera's been jiggling about, and he's been waving stuff around. Don't know what he's been doing. Okay, our ne next guest uh, is from the Wirral, uh, and he is the editor of Schlock Magazine and Lovecraftiana Magazine. Uh, he's also the author of a superb math mashup um, novel. Uh, Sinbad and the Great Old Ones. Uh, Mr. Gavin Chapel. Hello. <laughs> well, I thought it was. <laughs> I was trying to see because you've just got a little thumbnail at the bottom. I was trying to see what you were waving about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so what was it doing? It was actually. Uh, it's completely wrong. It's a, um, a glow in the dark cutlass. Not a radio cutlass. I suddenly thought. I like ah! it. Yeah. I'll start off with a sword. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, so how are you doing then, mate? You're right. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah not too excellent. bad. And yourself? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, so like to introduce yourself, sir. Okay, well, so I'm Gavin Chapel. Uh, I've been writing um, pretty much since I learned to write. So about three weeks, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I've, I've been writing for quite a long time, um, probably since I was about 20 or so. Uh, got nowhere with getting published. I started too high, uh, tried to get novels published, uh, yeah. and then moved on to short stories. Didn't get them published either. Then started writing nonfiction, local history. Got that published. Got a job as a um, creative writing tutor. That got me into editing, editing a um, uh, web for my students. Then I thought, hang on a second, I want to do something else. I want to edit uh, a horror fantasy uh, sci-fi magazine webzine that's how i ended up editing a little thing called schlock which has been going since 2011 uh, and along the way i also started editing uh, a lovecraftian uh, fanzine lovecraftiana which uh, has been going for about half that time now uh, so um and i've also done a few um uh anthologies that kind of thing uh i've got a t-shirt around here from one anthology i did which is quite relevant to this if you can make that out swords against Cthulhu. ah yes yes so yeah uh, it's a good one there's two or three volumes of that isn't it yeah, yeah the it's one. swords against cthulhu swords against cthulhu hyperborean knights uh, and nice. the final one is um it, it's set in the future the kind of post cthulhu apocalypse kind of future yeah Awesome. So, yeah, because yeah, I've got the first one. I need to get the other two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're on my they're on my ever ever expanding shopping list. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So yeah, would you like to introduce your story and give us a bit of a reading? Okay. Of so my story, I decided to start at the start, uh, or pretty much with D'Artagnan on his way to Paris. So he's not a musketeer yet. Uh, he's got his yellow horse. He's got um, uh, some money. Uh, he's got a his, I think his father's sword, uh, and he's just riding through uh, an entirely fictional France. Uh, is going through, it's on the borders between uh, Averone, Clark Ashton Smith's nice. medieval French kingdom, uh, and uh, James Branch Cabell's own medieval French kingdom. Uh, and I don't even know how you pronounce it. it looks like Poictism, but it probably isn't. Uh, but somebody, <laughs> I think it might have been Clark Ashton Smith himself, or maybe Lovecraft, said that the two kingdoms probably 
uh, were close together. So I thought in the 17th century, they'd probably be uh, provinces of uh, the Kingdom of France. So nice. the story begins on the edges uh, of those two kingdoms in a dark, lonesome forest. Excellent, uh, sir. <laughs> and uh, uh, D'Artagnan encounters a girl who's running through the forest. Uh, she stumbles out onto the road and he hears a story of strange evil and monstrosity. Uh, his, uh, her um, brother has been killed or is it be, uh, in danger of being killed by strange wizards and so forth in a chateau somewhere within the forest. So naturally, D'Artagnan decides to go and investigate, taking the girl with him. Excellent. Uh, Right, mate. Give me a nod when you're done. Great. D'Artagnan sighed. Let us hope we are heading in the right direction, he murmured. If not, we... He broke off suddenly, motioning to marry Suzette for silence. She turned her head first one way, then the other. What is it? She hissed. Sst! He enjoined her to silence. Somewhere far off among the listening trees, something was moving. Stealthily, it was making its way through the forest with padding footfalls on the dense carpet of pine needles and the occasional crashing of branches. Abruptly, the noise died away as if whoever or whatever were making it had stopped and was listening. No other sound came. D'Artagnan tried to get a fix on where their fellow traveller might be, somewhere up ahead of them, blocking their path. A breeze struck up, shaking the tree limbs. With it came a faint charnel reek that tainted the musty smell of the pines and made D'Artagnan gag. He was by no means a coward. Rather, he was a hothead by nature, more likely to overreach himself by rashness than to flee the field. But this lurking fear, this nameless dread that seemed to drift through the arboreal gloom, just as the odour of rotting flesh wafted through the thick forest, nigh unmanned him. He would rather face a dozen Spaniards in battle with no comrade at his side they learn what it was that was trailing them, tracking them through the trackless forest. Gently, he tugged at Buttercup's reins. This way, he murmured, gesturing to the left. We will circle around our mysterious friend. The girl's face was white. Her slim, pale fingers were tightly locked in Buttercup's mane. Her bare legs were shaking, as were her shoulders. She made not a sound, but let herself be led. As they vanished into the gloom, the sound of stealthy movement began again, moving toward the spot they had only recently quit. D'Artagnan led the pony through the trees, circling round as well as he might. Time and again, their way was blocked by branches or by fallen trunks. The funereal silence was broken by distant, furtive sounds. It seemed that they were now being followed. At first it seemed there was only one hunter on their trail, but it gradually became clear that there were more. D'Artagnan muttered a prayer under his breath and gripped the hilt of his rapier with his left hand. He was tense, ready to drop Buttercup's reins and draw his blade the first sign of anyone or anything. He remembered the girl's story, but now he felt less prone to dismiss her words as those of a hysterical female. Look ahead, the girl whispered suddenly. See, the trees begin to thin. D'Artagnan strained his eyes to see in the gloom. She was right. Ahead, the trees were growing fewer. The countryside seemed to be opening up. And yet, strangely, he saw no sign of the afternoon sunlight. A gloom that still lay on the open country on the far side of the trees. Eagerly, he led his pony at a trot, ducking to avoid trailing branches. Hope pounded his heart like a foot soldier belaboring a kettle drum. 
wherever they might come out. At least they were leaving the trees now. That tenebrous labyrinth weighed down on his normally irrepressible spirits, pressed down on him like a physical weight. He was taking no care to move with stealth now. He blundered through the woods in his haste to reach the open. They left the trees and D'Artagnan stumbled to a halt. Buttercup whinnied and the girl gave a moan. D'Artagnan wiped cold sweat from his brow. A half derelict chateau stood on the far side of a neglected, overgrown park. Weed choked gardens lay between them and the ivy clad walls of the house. The sky was overcast, livid like a bruise as if threatening rain, a far cry from the deep summer blue that D'Artagnan had seen this morning. Moisture hung in the air, oozed from lichen infested trees. That is the house, gasped Mary Suzette, and she slid off the pony. Laying cool fingers on his wrist, she said, that is the chateau of Guillaume the Saucier. And what happens in the chateau of, Le, of Guillaume the Saucier? Well, to find out, you can buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice <laughs> mate. <laughs> Nicely done, sir. Nicely done. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> he got the lingo and all. <laughs> Excellent, mate. Right, cheers for that. I will uh, take you off and I'll bring you back on in a bit. Right, oh, my final guest of the evening uh, is all about sunny, Cal sunny California, Mr. Josiah Witkowski. Hello, sir. And look at that. Look at that. Thank you. How's it going? Oh, man. Now that's a hat. <laughs> I have serious I, uh, hat envy. <laughs> I made the band. Oh, cool. Oh, that's really cool. I like that. That's a great, that is a proper hat, is that? Yeah. <laughs> nice one. Righty-o, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit for the audience? Uh, sure. Yeah, from Northern California. Um, a newbie myself, relatively. I just passed the two-year mark of getting published. Um, and, uh, I guess with these ones in particular, um, when I see some of these writing prompts, I'm always looking for a way, like, how do I fit my purple pistolera, who's kind of like my yes. female musketeer character in, and yeah. this one was too perfect, it was one of those ones that made me break, like, the straight historical fiction, like, okay, I'm gonna do it, it's just, yeah, <laughs> yeah I have no choice. Yeah, man. No, I remember you. I remember you. I you sent me a message, and I was just like, "Yeah, do it. <laughs> go, go, do it. <laughs> go write it." <laughs> yeah, because obviously the uh, that character featured in was in Worlds oh, Collide, wasn't it? Yes, yes, that was the first one. And yeah. what's good about this story too is it takes place kind of in the middle of that, it's like a little break in her oh, journey through nice. France. So, so, uh, so what's the long term plan? Are you going to put them all together into like a collection? kind of thing eventually well, it's in nordic press my first novella a right. collection of about 12 stories and a poem nice. and um i think i'm going to use this one as the intro to the second novella ah lovely yeah nice there's nice. a little bit of chronology going through them perfect yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a bugger for doing that myself all my stuff is all kind of <laughs> so sometimes i can't remember which bits go where though that's the problem i have because i don't <laughs> I'm, I'm completely chaos my my organization is terrible so it's just like which oh, i'm trying to where? get a little graph going but uh, there's a bunch of cross outs and yeah <laughs> races and yeah yeah you know it mate you know it <laughs> <laughs> Right then, sir, do you want to uh, introduce your story and give us a bit of a read? Okay, well, we'll start right at the beginning. Uh, I introduce the first, the Musketeer and Dolores, the, um, before she becomes a Pistolera. And I'll start at their um, meeting point. Cool, excellent. Right. The following day, under a gloomy sky of dreary clouds, the horseman dismounted at an ancient stronghold and tethered his true and valiant steed to a withered post before the hollow doors of entry to the sanctimonious housing of the decrepit fortress. Breaching the gating that sealed the outside world from the inner realms of calm and sanctity, the solitary figure entered the long-abandoned cathedral 
in a slow and solemn manner. He carefully approached Nalkuth, as if stirring the dust were a cardinal sin, and lit one of the votive candles with a striker, clutching the wax-filled flame with both hands. The slap of his thigh-high riding boots echoed within the emptied relic of a church. Stepping upon the dais, the man set the candle upon the austere stone altar. Kneeling, he relinquished his fencing sword to his right, and musketed bandolier on his other side. Making the sign of the cross, the mustachio man began his prayers, doffing his large hat to his breast. Hesto nostir kesis kills, sancti firitker, nomen tu. The man's Latin recital was interrupted when the altar shifted with a grinding screech, and a furtive shadow darted from behind the carved block. Startled out of his religious reverie, the warrior monk fell back on his posterior and screamed in shock. Mon Dieu! He quickly recovered his fighter's instincts and grabbed his sword, giving chase to the fleeing figure. His longer legs swiftly overtook the smaller sneak, and with his free hand hoisted the flailing form from the floor. In the dim light shed from the high stained glass, he could discern the features of a little girl in a soiled dress, overlapping dark, tattered breeches. Though her thick black hair, a smooth olive face, quite pretty beneath the smears of dirt and grime. Pivoting, the man deposited her down on the nearest pew, glaring at her like a stern parent. What are you doing here? What is your name? Where are your parents? Flustered by the man's barrage of questions, she looked at him with tear-laden golden brown eyes and squeaked. My name is Dolores. I don't have any parents. I was just looking for a place to sleep. Please, sir, I mean no harm. The girl's plight and sweet innocence struck at the heartstrings of the pilgrim. Taking a knee so that the two shared level gazes, he placed his hand over his heart. May you have my apologies, Mademoiselle Dolores. I mistook you for a thief. You may call me Aramis, one of the king's musketeers on a religious retreat. But as long as you remain by my side, I shall offer you my sword and my life to keep you safe from harm. The chivalrous manner and earnest words broke through her guard of fear and distrust, driving her to dive into his arms, clutching an athletic figure tightly as tears flowed down her cheeks. Patting her gently on the back, he smiled warmly as he continued his words of kindness. Now, now, little one, I shall get you fed and clothed soon enough, and you definitely need a bath, he chuckled, but then remembered their circumstances and surroundings. By the way, how was it that you were able to move the altar with those wee arms of yours? I I found a cubby hole in the back looking for a place to rest. I shifted a loose stepping stone and the block moved away from a basement staircase. It was dark, so I did not go down far. I came back up and slept till murmurs awoke me. The young woman stammered, rubbing at her leaky eyes. Most intriguing and unusual, Aramis drawled, twirling one end of his thin mustache. This is an ancient stronghold and place of worship for the Knights Templar from the time of the Crusades. The muscular tear tapered off his speech, deep in his own thoughts. His curious and inquisitive mind got the better of him in the end. Grab another candle, Philae, Aramis directed in a commanding yet adventurous tone. I must investigate. Maybe the Holy Spirit has drawn me here to find you in this specific location. A quest to assuage me of my many transgressions. The wandering penitent tore off his heavy cassock, revealing his vested puff and slash attire as he stripped on his blade and pistol. Eager and willing to live up to his request, now that she had a stalwart companion to aid during trying circumstances, the young girl rushed off to fulfill his demands. With both wielding a source of light, they ascended the dais to examine the displaced podium slab. Wily Dolores scrambled into the depression from which she slumbered, and tossed out the ragged bedding she used for warmth. From amidst the discarded cloths, a flung tomb landed at the feet of Aramis. Reaching down, he picked up the book to study it further. By God, girl, where did you find this? He eyed the binding and stamped cover, imprinted with demonic motifs and sigils. The title reads Necronomicon. The exterior seems to be bound in pig hide or human flesh. She recoiled in horror and disgust aghast at what she had been sleeping upon. She responded defensively. I found it on the stairs below. It was too dark to read, so I used it as a pillow since it was softer than the cold hard floor. 
Aramis skimmed through the couple of the vellum pages before closing the unholy grimoire. Written by the mother of Abdul Azarad. Intriguing to find this in the house of the Templars. Returning to the task at hand, he directed the girl to reveal the stairwell. Depressing a particular slate of granite, the squeal of pulleys and levers ground the altar piece aside, exposing a dark hole descending below the church. Taking the lead, the musketeer held his candle aloft as he pulled his pistol to bear, lowering himself into the cavity. Stay close, mademoiselle, and there should be nothing to fear. The first point of interest to be found upon the musky descent was the skeletal remains of a helmed man, robed in a disintegrating white tabard, emblazoned with a stylized red cross, imprinted upon the center of his chest. Dolores gaped, eyes wide with shock as she clutched at her rosary. Madre Maria, if I took a step further last night, I would have desecrated this soul's grave, for this is where I found the book. Aramis shushed the horrified girl as her desk declaration reverberated into the darkness. Holding his light on high, as if the bold musketeer could bravely reveal and expel all that was concealed and evil within the neighbor's catacombs, the warrior and vagrant reached the end of the descent to behold the confines of the secreted basement, courageously breached. The underground chamber, bathed in the eerie illumination of flickering candlelight, was ritually adorned with alien and pagnostic busts of horned and leering heads pedestaled upon each corner. Cresting the far wall of the hidden hall, an inverted triangular mirror of onyx or obsidian composition, dark yet reflective. As Aramis studied the craftsmanship of the statuary, Dolores was drawn to the black mirror, having never seen her countenance before, save the swirling and shifting visuals provided by a pond or flowing stream. Touching the smooth sheen of the dark, flat screen, Dolores recoiled as the cool, glass-like material appeared to re ripple, undulating undulating in a preternatural manner. The audible gasp of the startled girl perked the ear of the king's man, who set his candle down to rush quickly to her side. Dolores! Curses, girl! What have you done? The onyx mirror was no longer reflective, but an ink-black void as the candles dimmed. The three triangular points of the bizarre object distended, swelling into smoky, dark tentacles that drifted ghost-like towards the two intruders of the concealed sanctum of the centuries-old Templar structure. When a single blood-red eye opened at the center of the equilateral darkness, Dolores unleashed a piercing scream that echoed throughout the small chamber carved from the stone that lay beneath the church above. Pardu! Says the monster! A demon! And I'll leave it at a cliffhanger. If you want to finish. By the book! <laughs> nice! <laughs> Oh, see, I've been anticipating props because you said, you said. So, yeah, brilliant. Nice. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Do you want to uh, give us a proper look at the old rapier then? Oh, okay. Well, a little bit of a fencing. Ah, yeah. You know, it doesn't got the point. No. Nice. Saber. Excellent. Yep, nice saber. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, mate. Excellent. That was brilliant. Nice one. Okay. I'll uh, bring you back on in a moment. Righto. That just leaves uh, that leaves me. My story, again, um, like Gavin's, picks up um, quite early on in The Three Musketeers. Um, D'Artagnan's had his brush with the man of Meng, uh, Rochefort, and lost his, you know, <laughs> lost his note and had a terrible old time of it. And um, so obviously he's, you know, wants a bit of revenge going in there. But um, mine centers around the plot um, to use the diamond studs that the, the Queen gave to Buckingham uh, to cause war with, with England. So mine centers around that, that point in the story. Um, I'm going to pick up sort of a little way in. There's been a bit, bit of stuff going on, just did introductory stuff, but nothing too much uh, to uh, give away. Um, basically, the, the force of the King's Musketeers have gone into the Forêt de Fontainebleau. My, my French accent is terrible. <laughs> uh, hunting down the Man of Wang, uh, Rochefort. Uh, meanwhile, other stuff is going on in Paris, but you'll have to buy the book to find out what's going on there. Okay, so we're going to pick it up. They've just come to an old village which has been uh, raised to the ground. Well, it's not raised to the ground, but it's been deserted and left 
uh, to basically decay. And they think that they're holed up there. They're, the people they're hunting are holed up there, basically. Okay. Athos gave Monsieur de Treville a nod, then turned to Aramis. As they go in from the east, we circle around behind from the west. If we tread softly, we may be able to take them without bloodshed. Take who? Aramis frowned. I haven't seen a single soul. Again, reaching for his cross, he gestured towards the dilapidated buildings slowly being reclaimed by nature. This is a place of ghosts. The village consisted of a... Oh, fuck. Athos nodded in silent agreement. That may be so, but I can sense a presence here. Also, there are recent tracks over yonder. He pointed towards a cluster of ramshackled outbuildings. Perhaps they cower in cellars like vermin. Hmm. Perhaps. Well, whatever we think, we better get into position. You know Treville. He'll go whether we are ready or not. True enough. Aramis followed his friend around a clump of overgrown bracken and scrub grass. He seems, how shall I phrase this, eager to get this done. Any chance to get one over the cardinal, Athos smirked. Plus, would you not be eager to get on if you had D'Artagnan buzz buzzing in your ear? As the two men reached the building at the western point, Aramis clicked his fingers to get Athos's attention. Speaking of buzzing, do you hear that? Sidling towards the rear of the structure, which had once been a tavern or meeting house, and the largest still standing, Athos stopped and nodded. Treville suspects a swarm. Sounds like it's coming from inside. <sighs> That's all we need. Aramis tucked his cross into his collar and looked over towards the rest of the men. As he studied their movements, something struck him. You mentioned D'Artagnan before. I don't see him. Where is he? Concern spread across Athos's face. He should be with Treville, is he not? No. Zoot. Muttering oaths, Athos broke from cover just in time to see the wayward recruit charging into the centre of the village with his rapier drawn and a manic gleam in his eye. Man of Wang! D'Artagnan bellowed. We have you surrounded. Come face me in single combat. I demand satisfaction. Imbecile! Athos snarled, a sentiment shared by Monsieur de Treville, who could be heard roaring in fury at the far side of the village. So much for the element of surprise. Go. Adamus nodded, then pushed open the door to the dwelling and stepped inside. Athos followed, less than a second behind. Through the mildew and moss-encrusted walls, they could hear the sound of the rest of the men charging and screaming for blood. As their eyes adjusted to the light, their senses were assaulted by a putrid aroma. It was akin to the sweet decay of autumn and the earthy smell of mushrooms, mingled with something close to animal musk. It took every ounce of willpower for them to both avoid retching. What in God's name? <laughs> Athos choked, clamping a hand over his mouth. Outside, a blood-curdling scream sent the hairs on both of their necks on edge. I fear God has nothing to do with any of this. What the hell is happening out there? The scream was joined by the clatter of steel and a return of the strange buzzing sound. Make haste! To arms! Athos made a dash towards the front door. Before he could reach it, however, a loud clump from an adjacent room stopped both men in their tracks. Aramis held a finger to his lips and pointed in the direction of the sound. Athos adopted a fighting stance, feet apart, rapier up. You in there, come out this instant. When no other movement was heard, he gave Aramis a nod. Cautiously, he moved forward and started to pull the door open. Look out! From the darkened room came a nightmare. Rushing forward, buzzing furiously, was a five-foot insectoid abomination, somewhere between a giant fly and a crab. The creature's body possessed several pairs of limbs, thin membranous wings and a chitinous carapace. Aramis screamed. By far the most hideous aspect of the thing before them was what acted as its head. A fungal pyramidal growth festooned with questing tendrils like the fronds of an anemone flashed through a whole spectrum of colours in time with its manic buzzing. Look out! Athos cried as an appendage like the leg of a woodlouse shot towards his dumbstruck companion. 
Aramis was scared stiff and rooted to the spot. The arm was moving like a sword and would take his head off his shoulders if it connected. And if you want to find out whether they survive, <laughs> you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> Righto. Okay. Like I say, uh, audience out there, if you have any questions, we're going to bring every back, everybody back on. Uh, first off is Rob and Chris got and that? Mark and Gavin and Josiah. What ho! Right. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, like I said, um, audience, if you have any questions for us, get them in the comments. Uh, also, nobody's won the ebook yet. So if anybody wants to try and win an ebook, all you've got to do is answer this question. Which Cthulhu Mythos entity is also known as the Crawling Chaos? Uh, yeah, just put that down in the comments. And uh, the first person to get that in, I will check on the time codes probably tomorrow or Sunday or something. Uh, yeah, the first person to get that down will win a copy. Right-o. So, gentlemen, um, when you first when I first um, put this out there or contacted you about it or whatever, um, what were your first thoughts on this? Did something come straight to you or did you have to rummage about a bit? So we'll go around the group. So, Rob? I think that idea came very quickly to me. I, I don't know... Yeah. <laughs> we just recently watched one of the Man in the Iron Mask films. Was there a Leonardo DiCaprio one? Possibly, I think was. Oh yeah, was a fairly recent one. And like I say, that that just clicked straight away. Uh, perhaps because at the time we also just finished working on the Corridors project, which is uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, in yeah, 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 long yeah, terms exactly. quite adjacent. So uh, yeah, yeah, and like you, I'm a I'm a sucker for any King in Yellow stuff. So. Yeah, was, uh, exactly. That's why with the corridors, it was <laughs> as soon as you mentioned it, it's like, right, I'm in it, I'm doing it, I'm, <laughs> I'm writing it now. <laughs> so yeah, it came it came very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Chris. Unmute yourself, mate. There we go again. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was a bit of a strange process. It was like, yeah, how the hell do I do this? Um yeah. <laughs> what the hell is this about? Uh, yeah. and just you know, I started looking at it from the themes, like basically, how can I get some sort of satanic ritual in there? How can I get as much blood and violence as possibly could within within the pages? And then chat it to, to Claudia about it, and she had some interesting ideas as well. Uh, she's she's a big fan of uh, Lovecraft, right? So yeah. she sort of filled in the gaps. I see. Right. Yeah. Because um, yeah, because you were saying you're not, you weren't that. Yeah, I haven't read anything, anything about Lovecraft. So this is my first sort of first sort of Lovecraft uh, uh, piece. Um, you know, like subsequently now I think I'm gonna be three or four these anthologies with Lovecraft. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, it, it was a it was a fun process. She was like, "Oh, we can put this in, and we can put that in, and how about this, and how about that?" So uh, it, yeah, it it was fun. Excellent, Mark. Uh uh the idea of mirrors hit me quite quickly um ah, the yeah. idea of a mirror as a portal um yeah it's always something about that um mm. so so that's where i started and i wanted as i said with porthos i wanted to use some of the i don't want to say minor characters but some of the um the characters that i feel are sometimes put to one side a little bit within the mythos um yeah. I wanted to use somebody that wasn't well known, so that's why I went to Sophie Delacroix, um, as the mistress of, of, of Richelieu, um, sort of attached to Richelieu, but not Richelieu himself. Um, so it's, it's those kind of pieces, and then fitting them together into something that's workable. But I'm an, an arch pantser, so it was a matter of just starting, um, yeah. get words down, start from there, yeah, see where it goes. Yeah. I've noticed your uh, your buddy's turned I've up. Got a friend, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> you got to have your tentacular friends, haven't you? <laughs> right. So, yeah, over to you, Gavin. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what did I think when I first um, read uh, your your uh, what are it's called? Um, your thing Brief. about it. Things are brief, brief. Yes, yeah, brief. That's the one. <laughs> brief, brief is a good idea as well. I, should, I better go on with what I'm saying. Yeah, I thought, wow. 
Um, uh, I mean, I haven't actually written that many Lovecraftian stories. Um, yeah. Oddly enough, I've edited plenty, but I haven't written that many. But I was a big fan of Lovecraft when I was in my teens. I still love, love Lovecraft. Yeah. Um, and the Musketeer, the Three Musketeers. Well, when I was about 10 or so, there was a wonderful cartoon called Dog Tanyon and the Three Muskerhounds. Yeah. You know, I've had that blo the bloody theme song in my head all day. Uh, One for all, all for all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so uh, I, mean, I was really into the Three Musketeers then. I I read the book as well as watching the uh, the original book, uh, as well as watching the uh, cartoon. And I've seen some of the films as well. Um, so that the, and I wasn't actually entirely a stranger to bringing swashbuckling legendary characters uh, into the Cthulhu mythos, of course. Uh, yeah, of course. Sinbad and the Great Sinbad, Old Man. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, <clears throat> my process was basically, uh, okay, um, well, uh, D'Artagnan, Three Musketeers, they're French, right. Um, where does French kind of stuff come into the Cthulhu mythos or and the general wider kind of world? Well, there's uh, Averone in the Clark Ashton Smith stories. There's yep. um, the Charles Sorcier who appears in a very early um story by lovecraft there's yep. um the comte de Lett, uh, and the uh yeah. is it the cult de ghouls, cult de ghouls. Yeah. my um my title yep. uh the cult of ghouls uh, and then i just sort of went on from there with you know gothic shadows and uh frightened maidens and horrible eldritch monstrosities and uh, and then i submitted to you and you actually accepted it Yes, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> well, the thing is, I'm a sucker for anything that goes like for, for like you're saying, the gothic tropes. You give me, you give me like, you know, gloomy shadows and all that kind of stuff, and I'm a happy chappy. You know, and a <laughs> of 17th yeah. century ultraviolence. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so get a few tentacles in there, and I'm sold. <laughs> a steampunk orange. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, oh, that's another idea. Oh, <laughs> oh God. Yeah, people in top hats looking for a bit of the old in out, in out. Yeah. It has to be done. <laughs> that's a great lead to legal action, but it has to be done. Yeah. That's great. Possible hospital hospitalization. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Go ahead. So, okay, Josiah, over to you, mate. Well, like I said, it was just an easy match. Um, yeah. Dolores' story actually happens a little later than 1625, so I started out a little young. Um, and it's after the first book, before uh, Aramis joins the clergy. Uh, yeah. I, I figured that would be a good interactive yeah. point. And uh, yeah. as Gavin kind of mentioned, uh, how does France fit in? And uh, so I used the Templars who had a lot of the journey to the Levant and whatnot um, to get a hold of the Mad Arabs book. Nice. Yeah. 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 That works. That works well. Yeah. I'm glad somebody got the old Necronomicon in there. You know, it has to be in there somewhere, doesn't it? So, yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, I mean, for me, for my uh, thing, when, um, because this all came about because uh, Beth Patterson, had done a ridiculous anthology with black ink which was unicorns versus clowns in hell <laughs> uh and it was one of them things it started out as a joke but people sort of held her to it <laughs> so she did it and black ink basically put a, a put, put it out i think it's just come out now and um when she finished um curating it um, the people at Black Ink, Brandy and Shelley at Black Ink, basically said, does anybody else want to go a, a ridiculous mashup thing? And so, yeah, I was like a kid in the back of class, you know, like me, 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 me. <laughs> I do, I do, I do. And I'd had this idea for like, oh, yeah, no, Musketeers and Cthulhu. So it's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. so I just put that in the comment. They went, yeah, OK, do that. <laughs> so oh, fuck, it's happening. <laughs> so it all kind of happened quite quickly. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I was, I was glad that people like went for it, because when you do this kind of thing, it's a bit of a risk in it that other people might just look at you and think you're mad. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You know, because, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you must have that. It's like, I mean, is anybody else going to get this, or is everyone just going to go, Tim? What are you doing? <laughs> I think it's the same. Every anthology we've put out here has had a certain theme. So the first one was um, ancestors and descendants, prequels yep. and sequels, and then we had the cat one. Um, yeah. 
yeah and, and you always think well and, and i have had submissions in that have nothing to do with the theme of the book yes. <laughs> you know <laughs> um so it is are, are people going to get that theme and, and will it excite people to write yeah. something specifically for that book you know or only the mad authors are going to uh, participate. <laughs> yeah, they're the best yeah. type. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is I was I was really really happy with the with the uh, reception to it because yeah because you know there's always that risk that this it's going to be like me and Rob. <laughs> <laughs> And that's it. There's lots of pen names. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do lots of pseudonyms. Yeah. I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't contributed to the, the clown one. I, I, yeah. I've actually got more ideas about that. But yeah. Yeah, I probably would be carted away. You should keep an eye out because they're doing a whole series of them. Uh, right. the, the, new, the one that's open now is, what is it? Ghosts? Is it? The Poltergeist versus the Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. Loch Ness Monster versus Ghosts in Atlantis. That's it. That's wow. it. Wow. I need to start something. I might, <laughs> no. I might go for that. I, I've got an image in my head now. Right, okay. do it. There you go, man. Go, go, yeah, head of Black Ink Fiction, mate. Yeah, it's because uh, I think mashup things have become kind of a a bit of a thing of, of late, haven't they? Um, oh, well, we've had this, the Sherlock Holmes stuff and all that has, has been going for quite a while, isn't it? Yes. Hard-boiled detective Cthulhu sort of stuff. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, I suppose it's a as development. Long as, it's, as long as it's in the public domain and you can sit them together without trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's why when um, Nordic Press did a, a, an entire mashup anthology, <clears throat> which Josiah is in as well, uh, I did the mythos and wind in the willows. So it was like... <laughs> <laughs> and I, so obviously I had to do Sothokiwa, didn't I? Because, I mean, come on. <laughs> it just fits. <laughs> it just worked in my head. As soon as I saw the brief, it was like, oh, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. <laughs> it's like, public domain, I'm doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's a good place to have our next question then. So, if you were going to put together a ridiculous mashup, <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? So, we'll go around. Rob? Well, funnily enough, someone asked me this question just recently. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, funnily enough. Yeah. Oops. Um, <laughs> and I was a bit stumped. And I think it was John, actually, who came up with a suggestion that I, that I then seized on was uh, the prisoner. Oh. Village. Uh, a a full-on Lovecraftian take. And I think, as we were saying when we were chatting to, to Gavin on the podcast, which is out tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> ah, excellent, excellent. Um, the, and, and obviously, I think we had John DeLaughter in before because he wrote that big essay about The Prisoner and Lovecraft. There's a, a lot of crossover and parallels in there, but but something more overtly Lovecraftian. <laughs> set in, uh... <laughs> Very technical. Sorry, right, right, I'll use the combination again. Is that where you sharpen your pencils? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be after us soon. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that would be my mind, and I and I don't know how that would work with the rights or anything else. I'm I'm not sure how that would fit in at no. all. No. But um, I think that would be. I can just see that that big balloony ball thing. It's a shock off, isn't it? It's got to be. Yeah. It's got to yeah. be a shock off. Yeah. Yes. Or is it one of those, the glows of Yog Sothoth? Ooh. Oh, that's Ooh. nice. Ooh. That's now nice. you now you could be a yeah. form of spawn as well, couldn't it? it could be. Uh, could be. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Ooh. Nile Athetep oh, number one. Was <laughs> 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 yeah. that Azathoth? Yeah. <laughs> <He's never too. laughs> like nice, Chris. Over to you, uh, mate. So, because we knew you do a lot of mashup stuff, happen. don't you? So. You need to turn it inside out. Yeah. Like so let's think. Um, maybe, maybe the Punisher versus Cthulhu, uh, or you know, <laughs> something, something like that. You know, right? So you could just imagine uh, Frank Castle and you know, taking a. Uh, taking a gun and shoving it into a Lovecraftian creature's mouth, um, you know, so stuff like that. Yeah, that that that, that would be fun, wouldn't it? Or just that straight, would. 
that Judge would be Dredd good. versus Oh, Dredd. Judge Dredd, that would be that would work. That'd be cool. You know, you could just imagine him like yeah. he's got the boot on the chest of of somebody who's half transforming and you know, just uh, uh it's just blowing his brains out. Uh for nice. for most for most uh, ridiculous, uh probably this the UK audience will understand that Mr. Blobby versus uh, Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Blobby was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bobby, Bobby. Bobby was a very, very strange sort of co-host of a of a healthy <laughs> Saturday night entertainment show. It was basically a man in a large inflatable suit that was yeah. pink and had yellow spots. Now, the strange thing about that is that he went on. This character went on to uh, do several hit singles uh, that became number one in the nineties. Uh, uh, we got Simon Cowell to blame for that, haven't we? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it, it was hugely entertaining at the time, but yeah, it hasn't aged well. So we could we could do Mr. Blobby versus uh, versus Cthulhu. So basically, we've got all these horrible creatures that are descending from the cosmos, and the only person that can save us is Mr. Blobby. <laughs> well, the first time I saw that, I was like looking in my cup of tea, see if somebody had dropped a tab of acid in it. <laughs> <laughs> the weirdest thing is, do you remember Crinkly Bottom theme park? Yeah. But they made that he made a theme park. Did he, do, did he do that? Yeah, he actually did it. And it was at um Bicton House in Devon, right? Now, um, in the sort of early to early 2000s, I ended up working there because it's now an agricultural college, and I lived in the gatehouse. Right. Uh, wow. <laughs> I was I was working in the kitchens there, and uh, I lived in the gatehouse, so that was really surreal <laughs> this morning because there was still like crinkly bottom bits. Like that hadn't been taken down. Quickly, <laughs> bottom pits. <laughs> I was just like, "What the fuck is going on?" <laughs> right. Mark, over to you, mate. I the immediate thing. There's something that's been rattling around in my head since I did this, which is to mix the Cthulhu mythos with something technological. Mm. My immediate thought was yeah. to go to the internet, but going from that, robots versus Cthulhu. Oh, oh! You can take that further and go yeah. Skynet, couldn't you? Terminator. Ah. <laughs> that, yeah. That'd be fun. <laughs> yeah. Now robots. Yeah, that's a good idea. Now, oh, the, oh, you could go the other way, couldn't you? You could go with like really dodgy, like '60s sci-fi robots. Yes, that's you know, like the ones with all the, the spinning coat hangers on their heads and all that kind of. Probably the robot. I don't know if anybody hears into Doctor Who, but the Doctor Who episode robot. Oh yes, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Oh, I think, yeah. Big Especially when when it's grown, yeah. Thing, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Oh, <laughs> 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 I never understood why he did that. Why? Oh, but anyway, it makes me laugh every time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do really like Robot, but it's one of those that just you have to like the. The suspension of disbelief is really, really hard when yeah. you get, when you've got the robot foot, which is basically like a slipper with some tin foil around it, and it's like a a tank, and it's an like action a man tank. Cut out. It's an action man tank, isn't it? it pretty is. much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of point. Tom Baker in a Viking hat. That's a, <laughs> yes. That's yeah, 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 yeah. The clown outfit's just terrifying. <laughs> That's just oh, funny enough, if you, you're talking about. Um, <coughs> oh Tom! <laughs> and oh, wow. Now it's actually uh, Rob picked me that up from a, a convention in Milton Keynes. <laughs> so we've done an episode about uh, Lovecraftian Doctor Who on the podcast. Yeah, so there you go. <laughs> That's my choice, by the way. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> right, Josiah? What would you do, mate? Um, well, someone uh, brought up. Sinbad in the Arabian Nights mm. would be uh, fantastic. I, I thought another one I probably couldn't help myself with. But mm. uh, in Worlds Collide, we brought up the um, anthropomorphized uh, trees. Oh, yes. I and, remember, uh, yeah. I, I had oh, more yeah. ideas with that. I wanted to do like a deeper kind of dark undertone, almost like a, or a societal... Uh, what do they call that? Like um, a quip at society where... Um, like Animal Farm, they're using almost yes. silly elements like pigs or whatever, but it's telling a greater societal yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. critique. And yeah. so I was thinking invasive species coming along and wrecking shop 
upon the native grove, much like maybe what happened. Hogweed. Yeah. <laughs> much like maybe what happened with the Celts and the Picts and yes. your yeah. land or the indigenous and mine. So yeah. um, kind of reflect upon that with what would normally seem like a silly element. Yeah, that's a really cool idea, man. You have to do nice. that. I'll, I'll nice. read that. Okay. <laughs> I would totally read that. <laughs> Right, yeah. So, uh, right, we're going to start wrapping this up now. We'll just finish on one more question. So, of all the sort of Lovecraftian entity, oh, hang on, I better check the comments. Of all the Lovecraftian entities, what's your favourite, Rob? Mm, no, that's a tip. Ah, nice. I think nice, nice. Just, just for the scope and the trickery and the uh, conspiracy theories yeah. that it produces. I yeah. Think. Oh, yeah, Chris. I'd be the same for, for yeah. very similar reasons, yeah. Mm. Yeah, he's a he's a pretty popular one because I mean it's a, the one mm. that sort of interacts the most with humanity, really. Yeah. So got, the king in yellow as well, but you've got more so. Yeah, he is kind of right. like a trickster, isn't he? Yeah. 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 Mark, I have seen the yellow sign. Ah, <laughs> he's ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> nice, Gavin. Well, I'm trying to think of something other than the crawling chaos himself, because that would be the one I'd say. But I can't say that, because everyone yeah. else has said that. So, <laughs> um, oh, I don't know, Dagon. Nice. Nice. Yeah. And actually, South Arguer. South Arguer is probably... Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. He's mine. Yeah, South Arguer is mine. Yeah. Josiah? Uh, I think Rob said it best. I left the joke yeah. for those reasons he mentioned, but... um, Yeah. One of the maybe the scariest one in the book, though, and I forgot his name, are the hounds that you can only see from the corner of your eye that come out of the, the hounds corner. Of hounds of oh, yeah. 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 They they were never really used again, were they? We were talking about that before. Frank, don't know, I think Lovecraft invented the name, then yep. Long did the story, and no one else really picked it up until Brian Lumley. Brian Lumley yeah. refers to them. He sort of re renamed them the Tindalosi hounds, but I don't yes. think he actually brought them into any stories. He did with Titus Crow. They're in the um, yeah. uh, which one is it now? Yeah, the first of the uh, the books, the Burrows Beneath. Burrows Beneath. Yes, right. That's, yes. Yeah, that'd be where I met it. I ha I've read that one. I haven't read the rest of this Titus Crow stories, but I remember. Yeah, the, they happened. they crop up a couple of times in the Titus Crow stuff. Yeah, yeah. Which is probably my favourite stuff of Lumley's. I love that. I love all that stuff. I think Josiah's is right. It's, they're a great invention and, and something yeah. quite different from. Uh, the, the other things are quite godlike or few, but these are sort of yeah they're just weird time traveling. Traveling. Yeah, yeah 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 predators yeah I guess. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's uh some people have done them more um afterwards but at the time in the original sort of the circle no they didn't it, well, yeah it was basically lovecraft mentioned the name long wrote it and then yeah i think I, yeah then one of the things that's getting used more and more now <laughs> <laughs> Rob, quick, can we cover the corners? See what happens when you talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> cover the corners. Let, let Make me just round this corner. <laughs> <laughs> right, looks like we have a question here. Uh, it's from Beth, uh, who says, uh, did anyone have weird dreams as a direct result of your story? I have weird dreams all the time. Uh, a lot of my stuff comes from my dreams. It's quite a cliche, but it happens. Uh, I, I, I do it intentionally if I'm stuck. I'll eat a lot of really strong cheese before I go to bed. <laughs> Preferably with chilies in it or something, you know. Give myself some real fever dreams. Yeah. So, Rob? Well, like yourself, yeah. And in fact, the entire setting for the last anthology, Corridors, yeah. was from a dream. Very vivid dream where I pictured the whole setting and everything. Yeah, so that was quite an interesting oh, nice. one. So, yeah, it, it tends to go the as you say the dream and then the story sometimes oh nice i didn't realize that that's great yeah so so you'll be dreaming of the king have you <laughs> did you see the yellow side mate perhaps it's dreaming of me perhaps that's how it oh, works oh, there you go, there you go. <laughs> chris no bath because i don't sleep <laughs> uh. to be fair you've been awake that long you'll probably be getting them micro nap things uh, yeah, it's, I think the longest I've been up was about seventy-two hours once, mm, and wow. I, I, you know, I constructed a story after seventy-two hours. 
surprisingly it worked. Apparently. I was going to say, did you so really pay me for it? So it's not big enough. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think Grant Morrison did the same for Arkham Asylum. I think it was three, he was up straight for three days, and that's where Arkham Asylum came from. Nice, nice, Mark. I feel much poorer in that I don't remember my dreams. Oh, right. I get snatches when I wake up and I'll say to my wife, I've just had a dream about a train or something, and that'll be it. The rest just goes. Oh, ah, right. Yeah. That's why I have notebooks next to the bed. So if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'll scribble things down, and then I wake up in the morning and look at it, and it's just a bunch of gibberish. We talked about this before, haven't we, Rob? You, you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's that one you wrote down? 300 horses. I woke up and there was written on my notepad 300 horses and to this day I haven't got a clue what it means <laughs> and it could have been the best story ever I, I, I don't know what it was about or anything but it obviously had 300 horses in it yeah. <laughs> it's a specific number no <laughs> <laughs> we counting them and you're not for, uh, yeah. <laughs> Gavin well I used to keep a dream diary a long time ago and eventually it just spilled over into the real world but I, I did, I used to write lyrics a lot. Um, mm. I don't anymore, but at one point I got so um, obsessed with writing lyrics that I had a really weird dream. And then I wrote a song about the really weird dream. And then I woke up and I wrote it down. I went back to sleep and I read it in the morning. And it actually made sense. But nice. the dream itself, um, I was, if I remember correctly, I was, yeah, I was at school, because I was actually at school at the time. I was in the sixth form. Uh, and this new teacher started. And he was Philip Schofield. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't remember Philip Schofield, he was a TV presenter around about the same time as Mr. Blobby. Uh, you know, he's, he's he Gordon the Gopher. <laughs> Gordon the Gopher, yeah. Uh, he yeah. didn't have Gordon the Gopher, and he wasn't called Philip Schofield, but everyone knew he was Philip Schofield. And everyone remembered there was some kind of weird... Um, scandal about him and he'd vanished from public view some years back but no one could remember what it was so eventually someone put their hand up and said sir what was it that led you know what was the great scandal that led to you vanishing from public view for so many years and he told us a story about how he'd become obsessed with the occult uh, and nice. uh, dead bodies and all kinds of things he eventually he found a dead body on Hampstead Heath and he took it back to his cellar, kept it in the cellar, the intentions of using it for some kind of black magical ritual. But then he got sort of put off the idea and just left it there until eventually the smell became so much that the neighbours started complaining. And then that's what led to the uh, the weird, um, uh, you know, the, the scandal. Uh, and after that, he vanished from public, so he probably ended up in prison. But then he became a teacher <laughs> at my school in the dream. <laughs> 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 and then... I wrote a song about it while I was still asleep. Wow. That's and then brilliant. I woke up thinking, I've got to write this down. I wrote it down. I can't remember the exact song, but the, the chorus was, I kept a corpse in the cellar. You should have sold it to Slayer or somebody. Didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josiah. Well, uh, Last night I had four dreams, which is kind of rare these days, but um, it would take an insmooth Jungian of more degree pedigree than me to relate that to Cthulhu. So, <laughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of mine are really kind of out there. Again, again, it's probably because of the, the chilies and the strong cheese. <laughs> the gin. Yeah, the gin probably. Oh, the gin. You forgot to mention the gin. I forgot to mention the gin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a lot of mine are like really psychedelic. And I sort of wake up and I'm like, what the fuck was that all about? <laughs> you know, the stuff that like makes the magic roundabout look sane. <laughs> you know, the, see, oh, that's, that's, there you go. That back to the, the, um, the mashup. There's one oh, yeah. that I want to do. Yeah, roundabout. Magic roundabout and Cthulhu. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the esoteric roundabout. The, oh. <laughs> Dylan the wizard. The sorcerer. Yeah. The dog. Love it. Dave on the rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> Dave on the rabbit. Oh, I love it. I never trusted him. <laughs> the Still, we can't explain that. <laughs> Okay, right. We'll do wrap this up now. Uh, okay, so just before we go, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment, what you got coming out, Rob? 
Uh, I'm sort of between books at the moment. I've been focusing on the podcast, the Innsmouth Book Club. Yeah. And I think as Tim mentioned, we just recently launched Strange Shadows, the Clark Ashton Smith yeah. site. Um, I do have uh, actually totally out of genre. I've got a new crime thriller just out called Target, which is set in 1980s East London, a town of street drugs and gangsters and various oh. other things. Uh, nothing the, like the going, shut it, you slag in it. Oh, pretty much, yeah. The C yeah, word is yeah, quite yeah. a lot, so, you know. Is this Rob's autobiography? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> elements. There's elements in there. <laughs> well, as, as I say in the book, just very briefly, one of my grandfathers was a policeman, mm. and the other one wasn't, let's put it like <laughs> that. So, quite an interesting family background. <laughs> So yeah, I'll, I'll drill myself. So that's pretty much it. I'm hoping to get another and uh, Innsmouth Gold anthology out soon. Maybe sword and sorcery theme this time. Ooh, nice. Sort of thing. Nice. Chris, um, not related to Musketeers, uh, the, doc, uh, the Doctor Who anthology, uh, another Doctor Who annual, uh, Terminator, more Terminator stuff, lots of Terminator stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the Dracula stuff as well. So the yep. Dracula sequel novel, and then strangely, very strangely, uh, the story in uh, this anthology was picked up by a game company, and they're turning the story into an RPG now. Nice. And, uh, nice. The the rule set is uh, called Cthulhu, um, and written by a very experienced uh, Cthulhu uh, writer who's worked for Modiphius and Chaosium. And yes, we're, we're going to inject pirates into it. So I've been told, uh, and it's going to be released in September. Really? So there you go. And then a comic book company has also picked up um, the story. And uh, yeah, so I'd be writing the uh, getting the script sorted for that. And it's a fellow friend of ours, John Chadwick, who's going to be doing the artwork. So there you yep. go. Yep. And uh, some some idiot called Tim's editing it. Is that right? Right, you're editing this. That's, that's right. Good luck with that. <laughs> Man, Mark. Um, as I say, I've got a short story for the um, Atlantis themed mashup, uh, which I'm going to have to do now because I've said it on camera. Um, yeah. So I have to get on with that. Um, apart from that, I've got the book that's on my computer, which is Vampires, which is where I truly live, if I'm honest with you. Um, mm. But that's a 1930s set um, female noir detective vampire. Mm, nice. So I'm still I'm going to be writing out, trying to flog that, um, write a few begging letters. And I've started a, another project, which might be a book, which is again Vampires, but this time set in Westminster and more political. <laughs> Lovely. Which in the current climate seems fit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're going to have to have a Boris vampire, aren't you? Go, <laughs> Boris. <laughs> was inspired slightly by Yes Minister, if you remember that. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yes Minister. Yeah. No, it's brilliant. Yeah, Gavin. Uh, well, I'm obviously I, I'm anything schlock and uh, Lovecraftiana. Uh, whenever I get the chance to, when real life isn't getting in the way, which it does a lot. Um, a lot of things going on in general. But when I get the chance to, uh, to actually write things um, of my own, well, I mean, I was writing, uh, I've written the D'Artagnan story, of course, uh, and I've written another story for your Doggerland. And I intend to write at least another one. I've got an idea for uh, uh, the, the Stone Age one, but I've not had mm. the time to write it. Um, I've also been writing stories, submitting them to uh, sword and sorcery anthologies. Uh, David Riley's sword and sorcery, sword and swords and sorceries uh, series, which he's um, uh, it's got to its fourth one, I think. Now it's been very successful, very popular. Uh, and um, I had one story uh, published under a pseudonym in the second one. I've got another one which I've been told would be appearing in the fourth one uh, under the pseudonym. Uh, I can't remember now. Uh, what is that? <laughs> Lorenzo, is name? not Lorenzo. No. It's a very bizarre pseudonym which came to me. Um, I think it's Lorenzo. Lorenzo is something or other. Anyway, uh, I'm writing um, uh, about a, a kind of Conan style character called um, Kellen, a kind of Conan Tarzan um, mashup character, and he gets into all sorts of 
and horrendous situations and slaughters his way out of them. So, nice. Nice. <laughs> Josiah? Um, I took a little bit of a break to help a friend do a, a gaming module for a RPG. Um, a Kickstarter for an RPG uh, oh, nice. adventure module. But I'm almost done with the second book in the Pistolera series, and I can't wait to g give her more adult perspective because she travels the Mediterranean, you know, Egypt, Constantinople, Wallachia, um, and she's a little more sly and scandalous as an adult. So awesome! The awesome. Dogerland thing sounds pretty cool, though. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a good, interesting one. Yeah. <laughs> It's an interesting idea, that. <clears throat> yeah, excellent. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I've got another collection coming up. Oops, sorry, mate. What? Can I just say, I remembered my my student in oh, yes. Lorenzo D. Lopez. Oh, Look out for him. Nice. Oh, nice. nice. Lorenzo <clears throat> I have a shrimp called Lorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> a cherry shrimp, yeah. <laughs> He's blue. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I, keep, I keep crustaceans. What's the problem? <laughs> yeah, uh, I've got a another short story collection coming out in August, I believe. I don't know, some point soon. Uh, I yeah, Eugene by chance? No, 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 because oh. that, that's that, I've got to wait for all that to come out of um, copyright because it's all. It's all under like a year copyright, so I've got to wait for all that stuff to become uh, back to me first. But so, yeah, so that's about it. So, anyway, thank you then, gentlemen, for coming on tonight. That was good fun. And um, thank you all for taking part in the anthology. And uh, thank you, lot out there in internet land, for watching us ramble on for best part of an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> I will uh, see you all soon. Yep, yeah, thank you guys, and uh, wave goodbye to the audience. Yeah. See you. <laughs> <laughs> and while I find the button, there we go.